Looks like we are live on Facebook. We are Frantic Romantic, bringing you Hanging with the Friends, episode number 11. Tonight, we have a guest, Vivian Castillo. Hey. Hello. Hi. It's great to see you again after almost a year. Almost, almost right. I can't believe it's only been, I can't believe it's already been almost a year. <laughs> it seems like only yesterday you were lost in my bushes. Singing <laughs> yeah, yeah. To a crowd of people. <laughs> that was that was one of those things where I I went up there and I just sort of crossed my fingers thinking I I hope this is okay that I that I did this. It was uh, the best thing. It was <laughs> the most appropriate use of the space I've ever seen in my entire life. Well, thank you. What, what's that called? It's kind of, it's not really like a balcony. It was like a back wall. Yeah, it's know. just the, it's just the back wall. He just was in the wall. The retaining he was in the wall. wall and, holds, yeah, in the retaining wall. The, right, right. The retaining wall that holds the the grapes onto the hill yeah that's pretty awesome though like nobody knew where the singing was coming from and then it was like like batman they just shone the light on, on mike and he was like there he is you know you know next time i'll be more aware and conscious that you might end up there and i'll just like rope a light up there so that if it if it does come to that that moment you know we can just flip the light on real quick and you have a spotlight right just right there <laughs> <laughs> knowing our luck he's like at the wrong you. column though you know right no, it's cool. We're good. We're improv actors over here in, in Heart Studios Productions Incorporated. You know, we're, we're good right, at right. all the live stuff. Fine. Which is something I wanted to bring up. Like, I can't even really categorize you as one specific thing because you wear like 20 hats. Probably yeah. more. I don't know. You know, you're a producer. You're a playwriter. You're a songwriter. You're an amazing singer. You're an uh, opera trained. You're a uh, sick actor like i went to go see you in a, in a couple of your plays and i was blown away thank, um, thank you man list goes on you know what word like kind of sewer i like art i'm an artist i think that's artist. probably the most blanket word that we can use i think that's very appropriate now I'm an I, art an art doer yeah uh, so i'm really curious what were the plays that um wh what are some plays that you've been in um so the the ones that I really enjoyed being in the most, probably, where Shrek, I was Donnie. Right. Yeah. Oh, nice. Um, have you ever seen Young Frankenstein? Oh, absolutely. Love it. Okay, so I played Igor. Oh, man. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, that was fun. So I get cast as a leading male all the time, so I can sing baritone and tenor. And oh, wow. so a lot of times I have a stronger voice than a lot of the men who audition, so I end up being cast as the sidekick guy. Um, so I've been a male more more times. On you were in the B. A female. Hmm? You were in the B. I, remember, I really I liked doing that. Me, yeah, that was probably Dude. the first time that I really had like a good quality female role where I got to be a female. Um, I was in Avenue Q. I played Kate Monster, but in the Avenue the, Q, the, right? The, wow. The Daniel Putnam County Spelling Bee. I was Olive Ostrovsky, and it was a really, really, really fun role to play. But it was oh really wow. Sad. I mean, she's a really sad character. Her parents. It was. Just, it was she, sad, she, dude. I got choked up. It's hard. Right. That's I, I'm not even gonna lie. Sings, I love you is really, really a sad song. Um, oh my she's, god, dude! She's yeah, twelve I, I, yeah. years old. Her mom and dad don't love each other anymore, so they got a divorce, and her mom took off to an ashram in India so that she could just find herself. And her dad takes it out on her, so her whole life is just like being misunderstood by her dad, who doesn't understand her. So she ends up taking a taxi to the spelling bee because she won final round, and he's not even there. Wow! Like, to support her, so. There's a song where she get asked, she gets asked, um, what's the most like, what's a, a word fanciful or chimerical? What does chimerical mean? And she's like something that would never happen. And then she daydreams about her parents telling her that, that they love her. Oh my God. Yeah, something that would never happen. And it's them basically putting aside their own drama to to tell to take care of her, which they don't do. So it's just right. a really it's a really touching show. It's a really beautiful show. But so um, I mean, COVID, COVID aside, how, how often do you do plays? Um, we try to do three a year. So far, our momentum has been, we're a new, we're a new theater company. So my theater company, actually, uh, we do our own shows. We write our own, our own plays. And they are um, always about things that have actually happened. They're about things that aren't necessarily the norm. Um, for like the unsung hero, I guess. We like to really push the underdog out into the front. Um, yeah. So we've got a show coming up soon called The Date. And it's about a trans woman going on a date, which can go one of two ways. Yeah. 
fine oh, cool. or it's the worst thing that's ever happened um quite possibly you know getting beat up or whatever you know right. it's a very dangerous situation so we always do things that are a little bit more boundary pushing um so if you know anybody who has a crazy story that you want to see it on stage it's also a really oh. cathartic experience for the people who give us stories um, <laughs> i don't know if you've ever encountered this but people don't usually empathize with themselves right <laughs> They'll sit there and be like, yeah, so like my dad was a serial killer and he like killed my parents and blah, 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 like my stepdad or whatever. And then yada, yada, yada. And you're like, yeah, I missed the bus today. And they're like, oh my God, did you get to work on time? You know, like there's so much more likely to like throw their own emotions and feelings aside for you. Yeah. So what I've noticed with, with, with people is that when they actually get to watch their own experiences filtered on stage through other actors, they actually get to feel sympathy for the situation and realize what they have gone through. And it's kind of like a light, you get to see a light go on that goes, oh, I'm actually a lot stronger and more easygoing and emotionally healthy than I thought I was, or the opposite, I need help. And <laughs> I need to go talk to somebody about this. And this right. was more of a big experience than I, than I had initially thought. So wow. it's a really, it's a really cool, very cool vehicle. And I'm excited to see where it goes. We're hoping to eventually get four shows a year, but right now it's like two to three. Okay, cool. Well, I... I mean, I would love to go to the next one for sure. Yeah. Uh, when, Me too. Sorry, I'll go when, again. Yeah. When's the next one? Fingers crossed. We're going to try to get it up end of August. Okay. But it really depends cool. on how comfortable and uncomfortable people are in being yeah. in closed quarters with people because the show would be actually indoors inside of our home, like the one that you went to. Right. Um, because you experienced that close quarters feeling exchange of emotion when you were sitting there in that group of 40 people um it's a lot different than being outside it's a lot different than having other noise competing it's a lot different you know when you're all feeling it together simultaneously as you guys right. know it's different to perform on zoom versus performing for an audience of a thousand absolutely yeah <laughs> well you know i would love to um you know, share the with the audience a little bit more about um this place that we're talking about if if that's okay i i don't yeah, know go for it. okay cool so the hillside shire C castillo's hillside shire winery there we go that's the full name and <laughs> yeah i would love more of an education in this because ruben has told me some things but i don't feel like i've have i've really gotten a chance to talk to you about it um and i, I would just love to know some more about it i i know it's it, I mean, definitely you tell me, but if, from what I hear, it's been in your family for generations, right? It... No, actually. So my parents, um, he's Mexican, she's white, and they were both kicked out of their houses when they were 15 years old for dating each other. Oh, so wow. They started um, living together in their junior year of high school, and he got his contractor's license when he was 19. Um, Mexican kid really couldn't get hired from other people that wouldn't necessarily you know, pay him for what he's actually worth. Um, and so he ended up just making his own company. And my mom does all the bookkeeping and a lot of the design work and stuff. And they're just kind of like this unstoppable team. Um, got his contractor's license when he was 19, started his own business. And now he does high-end houses for pretty much everywhere all over California. Um, if you've ever been through Silver Creek, he built everything in Silver Creek pretty much. Um, he built part of the Fry's Mansion, I believe. Like he does some pretty high-end work and he just finished doing one of the buildings at youtube reinforcing it after somebody after the, the san, Bernardino, san bernardino thing oh wow um with the with the gunman so he went in and reinforced everything uh, to the wow but yeah no it hasn't been in the family for generations my dad okay i'm, I'm that with my mom i definitely <laughs> and, uh, well I, I apologize that i got that wrong but no, you're good. You're good. <laughs> Somebody's fired, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Get um, your facts straight. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, for anybody who doesn't know, I mean, this place is just a beautiful, like, it is very much a hillside shire, and it's just a, right. It's just this beautiful place that we had the opportunity to to play our our CD release show at, and and you know, it, it was it was an honor to 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 play on the same bill as you. You have a beautiful voice and amazing music, and uh thanks again for that i can't i can't say no, enough about that whole experience actually, as soon as possible i'd like to do it again right sure. we were talking about that the other night right right yeah. i think that would be great you know 
we kind of yeah, got our feet be, wet already, right? Yeah, we got our feet wet. We got a little time so that we can actually plan it. Maybe do an end of summer wrap up or something and get some more bands out there. Do I'd a be whole down. day. Yeah, you know, like a whole day. That'd be awesome. Or something. Oh man, I'm I'm so down for that. I think everybody's down for that. Everybody's waiting yeah. for that right now with yeah, you know all the restrictions. Huge open place, you know. Bring your picnics. Bring your right. kids. Do something. Let's co- let's go hang out with people. Let's go hang out with adults. Like. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, totally. You know, I, I, I mean, I can't say thank you enough. Like, it's crazy. I remember posting that we were saying we we're wrapping up our CD and it was getting ready to come out, and you were the first person to approach us and say, "Hey, do you have somewhere to host it yet?" And I remember thinking, "Oh wow, man, that would be so awesome, but that probably wouldn't happen." You know, like not in a million years. You know, just so many <laughs> logistics and this and that. And shit, it came together, you know? It's, it came together, and it came together so quick. And yeah. we have, as a, as a concert venue and as a wedding venue and stuff like that, we've dealt with so many different people. And not to say that they didn't handle their shit, but you guys really, really took care of everything. Like, the, the co-op uh, of the two of us, I think, was really, really something, um, something special that I haven't encountered with a lot of, a lot of other concert situations. Yeah, well, that's great. No, it was wonderful. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a shame that Rick isn't here because that was like a really special night for Rick. Uh, he, he, Rick's our drummer and he had been filling in for us. And, you know, we hadn't really told him that like he was in the band yet. Right. And, uh, mm-hmm. but we knew that we were, we were going to tell him at that show. And um, so right before I, it was maybe right before the show. Or... Sound check, right after sound check, like, or then we right sound check super soundcheck. early. I'm pretty sure I was there for it. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, we told him, hey, man, you know what? We, we want you in the band. And then he, he uh, you know, you saw some, some nice little tears in his eyes, that guy. Yeah. Tears of joy. So. Yeah, well, it's, it's an incredible, it's an incredible thing. And you guys have been working so hard for so long. I think that's something that the audience probably doesn't know. I met Ruben 12 years ago 11 yeah yeah like like over a decade ago right right yeah I was I think 19 because I remember having to um get checked before I went into the Britannia arms uh because I wasn't Mm. 21 and I was like I'm not drinking like I'm not gonna drink I'm performing here (laughs) so I had to get a little (laughs) wristband or whatever but I thought he was my cousin because he looks just like my cousin Steve Steve. and so I was like Steve (laughs) that's not Steve he's missing all of his hair what the hell happened and then he turns around and he's like also shredding and I was like okay well he's not Steve but he's he's like close like (laughs) yeah (laughs) I was like the Steve Light right you know Steve Light yeah right because he's way more metal looking like he's hella more metal yeah he looks very grungy (laughs) yeah Ruben was wearing like a freaking suit I think yeah, have you, you have you met Steve? Uh, yeah, me and Steve became pretty cool. We, we became buds. Yeah, we've, we've, um, we've jammed a couple of times. Yeah, together, yeah. And it's it's really fun. They're the same build, you know, similar look, but very similar look. Yeah. He's the clean cut <laughs> business professional version of my cousin Steve, who's just got this gnarly like big. He looks like he looks like Maui from uh, Moana. He does. Oh, he wow. does look like Maui. Yeah. But like, put Maui in like a guar shirt. Yeah. <laughs> and then have him go all the time because that's his face well i can hey you know i can appreciate a guar fan uh hey i can also appreciate a guar fan he's a he is a metal head for sure oh wow yeah, yeah that's crazy that was a long time ago i remember from there i started uh following you on youtube because you were putting up a lot of a lot of uh performances you were doing a lot of banter and i was just like I don't know. I became a big fan. You know, we became friends from there. It was cool. You know, it was a mutual fan thing. Cause I was like, your guys' band back when you were Skyway View, I was like, this, this group is so good. I cannot wait until they become something like, I just can't wait. And then, you know, I got to watch how it transferred from like singer to singer and how the band started just kind of changing the music style. And like, you guys are so different from where you used to be. <laughs> yeah, so we are. We are. Yeah. But so good. And still consistently you through all of it you can definitely tell that you've had your hands on all of this stuff and so like it's just been really cool and I really appreciate you bringing me on to projects and like including me all these years like I am so freaking blessed that we ended up becoming friends like I'm just so happy like you're yeah I am too beautiful and you're beautiful it's nice to meet you too oh thank you I likewise uh yeah I 
I don't know. You're, you're a very cool person. And it, I, it, it was a pleasure meeting you. Um, and I don't know. I, I, I'm looking forward to when we can hang out again. Uh, it, it yeah, sucks. and I'm looking forward to give you some performance grooming tips. Not that you're a bad singer. Just the healthy things. Just healthy things because I care about your health. Oh, thank you. I, know well, I appreciate it. I, I, I've been wanting to hit you up on that stuff too just because right now I sing like a frog and I eventually want to sing not so much like a frog, you know? Well, for your whole band, I mean, you guys always play your own backups and things like that too. You guys always yeah. sing, even if you're not the singer. So I want to just make sure that at the very least, you have a pretty good idea and a couple of tricks in your back pocket so that you can do things a little more healthily. You don't hurt yourself. And if you're at work talking all day and on the phone talking all day, and then you have a concert at the end of the night, you still have a voice, you know, to play with. Right, right. I mean, that's, that's, that's another thing, too. You're also a vocal coach. You also work with people. You have that experience that you bring from, from working with people that were highly trained in opera. You're highly trained in opera, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I started doing vocal health instruction, though, because there's a lot of voice teachers out there, and they can teach you how to sound pretty, but a lot of them don't understand the mechanics of it and actually how how thin that line is. Um, <coughs> this sounds good stylistically, and this is going to permanently injure my voice, um, mm. and they don't realize it. And so I've kind of, I'm really sad that a lot of my favorite musicians don't have the longevity that I wish they would. I really want to hear them perform for the next 10, 15, 20 years, and they're dropping out after two. Like well, I remember you were alive. you were telling me about Adele and how how her career has changed because of that, right? Well, I mean, she had two different vocal surgeries, right? And your voice is always going to change. Your vocal folds are about as thin as your eyelid. So if she's had two times that they've scraped off layers of it, how much vocal fold does she really have left? Right. You know, and if she does end up pushing it too hard and she snaps it, well that's $300 million instrument that's just kind of out the door. And that makes me very, very sad because she's such a, she's got such a relatable music niche, you know, and she does right. so much for so many people. So whenever people hear me, they're like, Oh, it's just because you're jealous. And it's like, no, it's not that I, it's not that I have a problem with them as a singer or as a performer. I just want to see them perform for a long time. Like, I love them so much that I'm willing to say, hey, don't do that because I really want you to be around forever. I want you to have vocal longevity like Shirley Basie, the lady who did Goldfinger. Oh, yeah. Goldfinger. And she so can still do it. Performing. Oh, my God, she's 80, and she is still such yeah. a fox. You can put her up on stage, and she sounds identical to yeah. what she did 50 years ago. And it's it's just, <sighs> that's what I aim to be. That's like my hope, my biggest hope is to just be like one one just iota of a talent of, of Dame Shirley Basie, 80 years old. Holy wow. Mm, a goddess. I, I, <laughs> if I live that long, I hope I could still play. You know what I mean? That's something that um, I you would never want to lose. you shredding at 80. <laughs> I don't know if I'd be shredding. Maybe I'd be playing like folk music by then, you know, singing like Bob Dylan <laughs> or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Gentle strum, right? Some Simon and Garfunkel, you know? <laughs> little Johnny Cash just get that. But like it'll be like Panic at the Disco like in the style of Simon and Garfunkel. I don't know, something like that. <laughs> that would be incredible. Let's do that fusion mashup <laughs> immediately. Yeah. <laughs> immediately. Okay. So, Vivian, I'm I'm curious um uh, you know, I I'd, I'd love to know more about like your personal history with singing and and music in general, kind of, you know, what got you into it? Who who inspired you to to start um It's a very strange story. Go for it. So yeah, I, my, I dig strange. My, uh, my, I do have music in my family. My mom is a really great singer. Her dad is a crazy person. Earlier I mentioned, you know, my grandfather was a serial killer. So that's actually a real thing. My grandfather was probably a serial killer. Oh, wow. Um, but he was also a music genius. So my perfect pitch actually comes from him. So thanks, crazy guy, for that one. Um, <laughs> At least that was the thing that came through. I mean, it could have been like the inclination to stab people. Right. That didn't come through. We're fine. We're doing good with the perfect pitch. I like that. But he has yeah. a gospel radio show by the time he was 14 years old. Um, so he's just, he's a, he was an incredible vocalist, really, really great instrumentalist. You could build an instrument and then give it to him and he would play it better than you. He's just such a freaking genius. Um, and so he taught my mom how to sing. He was very, very strict with her about it. And so she was really nervous about being too strict with me. She didn't want to scare me. 
Um, didn't know that I was a singer until I was like 10. She went to go turn off my radio and I, it was me singing in bed. Um, but I didn't know that I could sing either. So I got very, very nervous. Hi, Isabel. I would get very, very nor nervous in performing. I wouldn't breathe. And so then the ad weird story adds on to become a weirder story. My brother, Michael, was adopted when he was 21 months old, had schizophrenia and, and fetal alcohol syndrome or whatever. He tried to blow up Live Oak. Um, oh. And so we got chased out of the school system. And so I got sent out to the middle of nowhere in Watsonville to this private school. And that's where I met my singing coach. Um, and he's the one who actually identified that I had a voice and he was like, would you like to learn how to use this? And I said, no. And I really, there was a lot of pushback because I wasn't interested in singing. I wasn't really that interested in, not interested, not, not interested in music. I love music, but it wasn't something that I was like trying to pursue. It wasn't something that I ever entertained as being a career choice for me. Um, and he's the one who taught me about vocal health. And that's when my nerd brain started getting very fascinated with the mechanics of everything and how he could manipulate us by putting us standing next to different people. And we would sound completely different. Same chord, same harmony, same everything, but just moving us around the room would change the dynamic completely. Mm, and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff really sparked my interest. I was like, wow music and reverberation and vibrations and harmonies and all of this stuff is incredible and how can we make this much music with eight notes like we only have eight that's incredible to me that we can make so many things out of just eight notes like right all of that kind of sparkled in my my back of my brain and at the time i was in a lot of musical theater and i was realizing that a lot of the characters that i wanted to play all had songs no matter if they were pretty or not they still had to sing and so that's when i started asking more questions in choir to my teacher um how do i change my voice how do i make it sound like this how do i make it go deeper how do i do this accent how do i do this and so i learned how to sing in 42 different languages oh wow um, i got to tour and perform all over the world uh, in different concerts and stuff like that in a, in a really great choir so i got to learn about harmony and different diction phonation and how resonance works and how to sing in a place where the the resonance actually takes 15 seconds for it to come back to you so you're literally singing and then you wait and then you can continue singing because it takes that long for it to reverberate and come all the way back to you. And it's so freaky that you can, it sounds like you're singing it. My voice did, my voice did, my voice did. It's not, it's, it's so staggered, but the audience is hearing it right, right in time. And wow. so that was an incredible experience. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. Carnegie Hall when I was 15, that was, wow. Cool. I now know that Carnegie Hall does not have good acoustics. <laughs> interesting if you are <laughs> yeah. in this six inch square on the bra of the stage there is really great acoustics and you could scratch yourself and people in the audience could freaking hear every single detail of it but if you <laughs> step one foot back sound wall there's nothing no sound <laughs> at all we had 500 people on stage you could not hear us at all at all at all it was bad oh wow um, so you went on tour um with this group and so how long did that last and and like what, what were some of the places you went to um we toured france in 2007 so i got to sing at the la madeleine in paris it's one of the biggest cathedrals in central paris i got to sing in notre dame Rouen. wow I got to sing at the pantheon i got to sing high mass the vatican in italy i got to sing in a beautiful cathedral in san marco square in venice um, we got to sing at the Parthenon there, which was very cool because that's not allowed at all. Um, <laughs> they don't let people inside. Uh, and we said we were a choir. And then they were like, oh, well, maybe if you're good at singing, you can go ahead and come on in. If you don't, they're like, if you don't suck, right? Yeah, yeah right. Oh, you don't yeah. suck? Okay, yeah. cool. That's fine. Okay. Sweet. I got to sing come on, on CBS when Michael Jackson died. Oh, oh wow. wow. So that was cool. I actually got interviewed. There's a 15 second blurb of me saying how much I like Michael Jackson after he died in Times Square. It was really cool. Hi, Isabel. Wow. Um, did, they, did they get you like at a bad time though? Was it like one of those like, you're about to drink a soda and they're like, oh yeah, I love Michael Jackson. <laughs> Go back. Yes, yeah. no. Okay, so I was on, I was on choir, choir trip with my, my Christian school choir and all of them had something to say about Michael Jackson. And I didn't realize I was the only Michael Jackson fan, fan among them all. And so 
when they were like, is anybody a fan? Does anybody want to get interviewed for Michael Jackson? I went, oh, because I thought <laughs> if I got it. I got to really like get chosen because nobody else, everybody <laughs> else is going to put their hands up. Nobody else put their hands up. And I'm just like, oh my God. So I had, <laughs> I had this big target on my back the whole week of them being like, I can't believe you like Michael Jackson blah, 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 and saying like really horrible things to me. So that was really intriguing, but no, it was good. It was a good interview. Do you have a, a, a just tangenting a little bit, do you have a favorite like uh, era of Michael Jackson? I love Michael Jackson because he changes from era to era. Yes. I think that's the thing that really gets me, just like the Beatles. Adapted, yeah, yeah. adapt, the you fact, have to adapt. The fact that he was able to say, okay, well music is changing like this and he wasn't stubborn, he didn't dig his heels in, he was like, all right, that's fine. He did so many genres of music from age five to age 51. I mean, like he did everything. He's like, and we owe so much, so much to genre change because of him. Yeah, exactly. He's, he's reverse Nickelback. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> this is true. Nickelback does go back. That's all they do. Uh, sorry, Nickelback fans. I didn't mean it. Um, or Nicolas Cage as an actor. I think he's <laughs> the opposite of Nicolas Cage as an actor. I think it's just Nick, Nick stuff. <laughs> Especially the Nickelback, though. <laughs> you have Theory of a Dead Man. Did you ever hear that band? Where Nickelback tried to become a new band and then it was just Theory of a Nickelback? Oh, is that really? Wait, hold on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> it right, wasn't really it... Theory of a Dead Man, it was Theory of a Nickelback for sure. Oh, wow. I, I don't really know anything about Theory of a Dead Man. I just know that they exist. And then, like, later on, they change their name to just, like, Theory, right? Or something? I, th I don't remember. Because okay. it was just Nickelback Part 2. And it was right, just really, yeah. Like, they had such a bad name for being Nickelback, so they were like, well, we're going to change it. We're going to change our name, Theory of a Dead Man. Nobody liked that one either. <laughs> wow. Look at this crowd. <laughs> You know, everybody's saying now that, um, and I don't necessarily agree with this, but I, I'd love to, I, I'd love to know your take on it. Both of you actually, because I haven't talked to Ruben about this either, but there's this weird cultural thing right now where everybody's calling um, Imagine Dragons the new Nickelback. And I'm, I'm not a fan of either really, but I, I kind of want to know what you guys felt about that because I don't know no, if I agree you, with that. If you listen to Imagine Dragons' first album, it is super diverse. And I think it is, the it industry is. boxed them in kind of like fun. I don't know if you ever heard the fun, band Fun's first yeah. album, yeah. the format. Yeah. Before Fun was fun, it was the format. And they were very diverse with their lyrics and the things that they would sing about. And then they became fun and there was no fun left. And it was right. Like, <laughs> so I think... That's what happened to Imagine Dragons. It's very, very possibly that the music industry just hamster wheeled them. Right. Um, because their first album was all over the place. There was like a, there was like a bluegrass one called America, oh, wow. something like that. There was right. um, some really like gritty kind of club music. There was a lot of, of there was a lot. It was range. It was a lot of range. I, I'm going to say that when I first, first, first heard them, I dug some of their stuff and then and then I just became that mean kid, you know, I was just like, uh, whatever, you know? <laughs> because they're popular. You know, and it's not, maybe it's because they're popular, but it was just something was, something wasn't very genuine about the sound anymore. And that's what I kind of became that, like I said, that mean kid, you know, I became the dude from the Muppets, you know, the two old men or whatever. Right. Um, it's like a, yeah. I mean, I, th I think with internet culture now, it's very easy to fall into into that because everybody has a platform for an opinion now right and it's and it get I, I fall into this habit too where it's like it's so easy to to come up with like a very cynical opinion about something and actually have an audience for it um which right, i think right. is interesting and i think it's something that hasn't really always existed until i don't know 15 years ago or 10 or 15 years ago once right? social media got really really like YouTube. big you know YouTube, yeah, that too. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. I think when people started doing the vlogs, that was really when it became like, uh, oh, you can get subscribers just for walking around and showing people your house and how you feel about things. And that's right. even into that culture of people are subscribing to your opinion, even though it doesn't matter. Yeah. Right. And, you know, Ultimately, and the sad thing. Of our opinions matter. No. Yeah. <laughs> And, and I mean, really the sad thing is, is like, I, I, I do feel like there's people that have made careers off of 
they know that they're going to get more hits by saying something is bad than saying something's good. Right. So, and that kind of has sort of fueled this thing too, where it's like, Oh, well, if you have a hot take on imagine dragons, right. If you have, if you have a hot take, that's like, uh, whatever counter counter popular, then, uh, people will click on it because they, they want your hot take. You know, it's funny because (laughs) I had seen, um, I had seen something, right? It was like memes or something like that because, or about the band Trapped, how they were trying to get themselves relevant again. And I had seen this thing saying that Trapped is like the new Nickelback, right? But see, Trapped, Trapped was really relevant, what, like 15 years ago, right? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, and then he became a super loud, like, douchebag. And never- <laughs> well, he, he became what we're talking about. Anymore. He became exactly what we're talking about. That dude who was like, hey, pay attention to me. I'm going to say some mean shit. You know what I mean? Like, that's, that's pretty much all he did. He just started talking shit about everybody, you know? Yeah. Well, there was that whole feud recently, right? The body count? Yeah, there was a whole feud recently where where the, the singer of Trapped was trying to argue with, I don't know, what was it, Dance Gavin Dance and some other bands where he was like, yeah, you might have more hits on Spotify, but I have more hits on, Pat- uh, no, not Patreon, uh, Pandora, right? His whole thing was like, yeah, I have more hits on Pandora and that's like fringe class, you know? That's like cutting edge that's like where the cool kids go or something. And it was, it was really silly. But anyways, I've never heard a trap song. That's like me being like, listen, I don't really have any hits on YouTube, which I don't because my social media is dead. Um, But I have a lot of supporters, imaginary supporters that I'm just going to tell you about (laughs) right here. (laughs) That reminds me of South Park with the hypothetical dollars. I'd be a hypothetical g- g- billionaire or something like that, you know, a chocolate rain guy and oh, uh, right. Ron guy. The and, internet, um, the internet dollars, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. hypothetical <laughs> dollars. For real though. Oh. Yeah, it's it's weird. I think also though, sometimes people are douchebags just to be douchebags, and then sometimes people are really trying to just like be validated in the fact that everybody else likes this and I don't, and I feel like a creep. Like, mm. I'm not a fan of Adele's music. I am not a fan of Beyonce's music. I have been, I have been raked across the coals for not liking Lana Del Rey. Holy wow. Oh. It's like, it's a personal opinion. I just don't like it. I'm so, it's not the type <laughs> of music I listen to. And yeah. as a vocal teacher, I'm listening for totally different things. And I know as musicians, you guys now listen to totally different things when you're listening to music and you listen to the right. music you listen to for eighth or ninth grade and you're like, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. You get a different perspective just based on your, you know, professionally what you've been doing or what, whatnot, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's, I kind of think it's a curse and I kind of like that I have the ability to do that, to listen for other things, to listen to uh, the musicianship that's happening in the song, the uh, how, how nice well it was composed. Right, but you know, it's hard to just enjoy things sometimes too, you know what I mean? If I'm at a show, I'm just dissecting the whole thing. I'm ripping it apart. I'm mm. like, oh, that's, that's nice. Look, look, they're doing this, you know? And my wife will be like, just shut up and listen to the show. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> all right, all right, you're right, you know? My, uh, yeah. my house used to be a house full of writers. And so instead of having a swear jar, we had a ruining things for people jar, um, <laughs> pointing out inaccuracies in films, uh, messing with uh, film loopholes, pointing out shoddy romances, pointing out unnecessary plot devices, pointing out unnecessary angles, pointing out bad inconsistencies with like any of those things. Like, I mean, like really, and that jar, I think there was probably about $150 in that jar by the end of like yeah. four months all of us were broke in the house like we were like crap dude we can't we can't watch movies anymore like sounds like we need to have a movie night because that is right, right. that sounds like a ton of fun oh um, man you gotta get the jar out and then all the money will just go towards like putting up a concert or something like that just i i just would sit down with a bag full of quarters and be like all right so that's that's what's gonna happen tonight i'm just gonna throw all my quarters in this car <laughs> yeah looks like i'm not doing laundry you know yeah for real my favorite kind of movie to watch for that kind of thing is anything having to do with time travel because I'm, <laughs> I'm usually the guy sitting there being like, wait a second, that would cause a paradox. Wait, no, you know, yeah. like uh, back to the future. I love back to the future, but back to the future makes zero sense. Or you know, I heard a like theory a science that science jargon they try to put in there. It's just all right. oh, yeah. science words. They're just yeah. reaching into the ether for <laughs> totally. Yeah. 
I heard this theory that Marty died multiple times and Doc's just coming back and saving him like over and over and over again. <laughs> but his, his dumb ass just keeps dying, you know? I see that. And that's why Doc always knows where to be, like when he catches him, like last minute, you know? Yeah. <laughs> that's a very like Rick and Morty take on on Back, on to, Back the to the Future. Right, yeah. right. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I know this sounds cliche, but definitely like in college, I think was my huge phase for for picking things apart a lot, you know? And I, I think maybe everybody kind of goes through that, right? Um, but like with music, with movies, with shows, it was that I think that was my window of like really, really, you know, bugging people about that stuff. Um, yeah. And then I think after that was was the whole hate watch phase, which I think I'm probably still in, where you just watch bad movies because they're so enjoyable. <laughs> I I, st I love doing that still. Like sometimes I'll be like, you know what? I don't want to think. I just want to watch a really shitty movie tonight. I'm gonna watch. Let's see what Nicolas Cage has been up to. You know, like that's oh, totally yeah. I've been watching that's How the to mood. Get Away with Murder, and I gotta tell you, it's a really terrible show. But I really like watching it with my eyeballs. And I'm like, this is awful. <laughs> Next episode, <I'm> like. <laughs> I've never seen that. I saw, I saw the the promotional stuff for it, and I was like, eh. "It's like Dexter. If Dexter got a hold of its acting and they like included more brown people, but that's pretty much it. Like, it's not great. It's just not great." Dexter. Cool. Dexter had a very. Watched... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, if you sorry, I cut you off. It's it's lagging over here. But if you ever watch Dexter and you just think like, I don't think any women and or brown people had anything to do with the script. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. And it had a very like strong first season, but then after that, it just, I heard like the first three were, were cool. And then it just kind of plateaued or whatever. Well, okay. Mm -hmm. It, so season one was, was pretty strong. I thought the strongest season two was like, it was fun. And they season... had a lot of throwaways. Season one and season four were probably the only ones really worth watching, and that was because John Lithgow makes the really incredible murderer. Four was my favorite. I I loved four. Um, John Lithgow is in, insane in doing that crazy behind the eyes acting, where it's really nuanced and it's so like just gently bubbling under the surface, uh, and you're really like, this guy's insane. This guy's he really was terrifying. Cool. It's so terrifying. Yeah, and they should have ended. He's an incredible actor. Yeah. Like, they should have ended the show with that season, I think, with, uh, I mean, I won't spoil the ending for any forthcoming Dexter fans, but uh, the ending I thought was, like, pretty, okay, there's, like, a poetic ending, right, for this for this main character, like, it, oh, okay, things came back around, right, but. Um, they came back around, but it made me roll my eyes really hard at the end when he's like, I'm just gonna, whatever, you know fill in the blank you know exactly what i'm talking about it just seemed kind right. of like a cheesy wrap-up like they were looking for a way to close it up with like really neat edges and put it in a nice little wrap box and it's like he's a serial killer right <laughs> <laughs> and then th there was a season after that with um edward james almost and uh colin is it colin hanks which was okay colin hanks that that season was all right and then I stopped because someone had told me that like his sister falls in love with him or some weird thing. And I'm just like, ah, I, I don't, I don't know if I need to see that. I don't need to watch that. I don't need to yeah. watch that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So whoever wrote Deborah in the first place just needs to be canceled as a writer. Like you yes. just need to put the pen down. They shouldn't have ever written that character. She was not likable. She did not deserve screen time. Like there was yeah. nothing intelligent or witty or sexy about her. And then the casting was awful. Like they should have just nixed that from the whole show. And it probably would have been a way better show. I agree. If they would yeah. have just canceled the sister completely and put somebody else in there. I don't know. You know what? They should have done what Family Matters did, right? You should have just sent her upstairs. <laughs> just go upstairs. That's it. And then we'll never talk about her again, you know? Yeah. Just go upstairs. We don't need to see you. Oh, uh, they should have also canceled the 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 lady who's the higher up uh, his oh the, yeah the boss god dude the misogynistic writers whoever wrote her they yeah. were like let's just like make her on her period every episode let's do stop <laughs> yeah it was yeah that was it was bad writing i that show i don't know it deeply offensive to anybody with a uterus yeah yes yeah 
Because I don't know. They, and I'm and not then, deeply offended by anything. Yeah, I mean, because with the sister, I mean, it's like she, I think the main problem I had with the sister is like she would fall in love with just some new guy every season and that that seemed to be her thing, you know? And it's like, why? I don't know. It just, it, it felt She's bad. She's a detective for Miami Homicide. Why do you have to focus on her getting screwed over and dumped by boys? Like, right. She watches murderers literally daily and cleans blood off of walls and stuff like that. But you're going to have her get her feelings hurt because some guy didn't call her back. Like, Yeah. And then just to have her eventually fall in love with her brother is like, okay, no thanks. But we're like, but they're adopted. So it's like, no, no. Listen, Pornhub front page. No, we're not doing that. <laughs> yeah. But there you go. There you go, Ruben. Dexter in a nutshell for you. There we go. Yeah. You don't have to watch it. If you do watch it, just watch season four and just call it good. Yeah. You know, nowadays I have a lot of trouble getting time to find to watch anything, right? So if I I usually I don't know, I I, I go with a sure thing, you know? I'll do a little bit of research and if it's something that's like, okay, this is good consistently, then then I'll watch it. Because I really don't get a lot of time to watch TV nowadays. Yeah. Or streaming or anything. You know, I don't. I just don't. Yeah. It's funny. Yeah. Okay. Do you like do you like horror movies? Um, I'll watch a horror movie. You know what? Thrillers. I like I like thrillers. It's probably more like a thriller. Yeah, like I like. I don't know. It's weird. A lot of people will recommend something, and I'm like, this isn't really horror. This is like a torture movie, and that's okay. You know, it's uh, like I'm not talking about torture porn or gore porn or whatever like that. I'm not talking about <laughs> right, porn. right. I'm talking about no, no. actually thrilling, like ooh, that kind yeah. of makes me nervous kind of movies. There's two right, on right. Netflix. There's one called The Green Room, and I think that's really terrifying because it could actually uh, happen. And I saw that. I love that. Yeah. Perfection. Yeah. So The Perfection is much like The Green Room, and you're sitting there and you're going, uh oh, this is way too realistic for me to like be comfortable with this anymore. Um, yeah. And I'm just, I'm just nervous about it. Like <laughs> it just makes me nervous. Yeah. Green Super Room dark was. Dark Times is like that too. Super Dark Times. Super Dark Times is a really incredible movie. The, all of the bad things that would normally happen at the end of a horror movie are, are the first 10 minutes. And then after they, they talk about what happens after the, the worst big bad thing that could happen, you know, like oh. the after effects of, of how yeah. it's going to, because like you watch a horror movie and you're like, okay, so they watch their best friend, like peel their own face off. Like, how are they going to, they're going to go to therapy? Like, <laughs> right. <laughs> No, I, I know what you mean. Sit like, on the couch and talk to somebody about that. I want to know what happens after the fact. I want to know what happens after they survive this whole, this whole ugly experience. Well, I, you know, yeah. I think about like uh, I forget which Friday the Thirteenth it was, where like it was Corey Feldman's character who killed Jason, and like you know, in another movie, he's a grown up, and at the end, he ends up becoming like Jason, basically. You know what I mean? He snaps, and because of the trauma, you know what I mean. So it's mm -hmm. like that's those are the lasting effects or whatever. Now I'm not I'm not praising the writing here or anything like that. I'm just saying, you know, it's, I thought that was cool that they finally did pretty something deep. like that, like a follow up. You know, it's pretty deep. Yeah, for, you said a... Jason. Jason, yeah, it was. It was. I forget which part it was, and it wasn't even like the guy who was killing everybody wasn't even the authentic undead Jason. It was this cop whose kid got killed. He snapped and he started killing like all the people who were involved and oh. and taking care of his kid. Like his kid was like a like an orphan or something, but you know. He knew it was his kid. Some shit. I don't know. So it was a law-abiding yeah. citizen meets Jason? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Sweet. I would less watch Jamie Foxx, though. watch that, Jason. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it was a little less Jamie Foxx, but yeah. I could, do with, I could do with some good Jamie Foxxing. I think he's great. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Even, even as Electro. That was, was weird. That was a weird choice, you know? <laughs> <laughs> he was the one fun thing in that movie though like uh amazing spider-man 2 you sure it wasn't rhino it wasn't uh paul yeah. giamatti paul giamatti as rhino i love paul giamatti i do too i think he's he's great i think he's fantastic paul I giamatti sent you, i sent you a picture of my ex-manager right in his prison in his prison right outfit. right prison okay outfit, so yeah. i really want to write a movie about my ex-manager and cast paul giamatti <laughs> that's him <laughs> yeah hilarious <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. awesome so the reason i don't have any social media for anybody who's watching right now um the reason i don't have a social media is because i have an ex-manager and he is now currently a permanent resident of san quentin uh oh wow 
So he had access to one of my external hard drives and one of my drop boxes. And I was very, very nervous for a number of years that if I were to publish anything, he would try to tear me down and legally take me somewhere that I was not prepared to go. Oh. So I kind of pulled off my social media presence and now I don't really have anything up. Um, restarting my Facebook, restarting my, my YouTube, all of that stuff is being taken care of this year. It's wow. been really annoying though. So can you tell us a little bit? Sorry to hear that. You got going on? Yeah, I know. It's a freaking nightmare, you know? It How many years nightmare. were you working with him? I was only working with him for like two years. Um, but this has been a lasting process. They just finally got prison after, God, years and years and years of court. So he took about six years of my music life from me. Wow. Jeez. Very sorry to hear that. It's okay. I've got a bunch of music about it. And I'm going to write some movies about it. And I'm going to nice. make some money off of how gross he is. So, Can there you tell you us a little bit about like some of the music you got in the works? Like uh, some of the, I don't know, any of the, any of the things you got going on? Well, um, I've been kind of moving towards doing my production company thing. So I have been writing music, obviously, always writing, right from my yeah. own experiences. Um, so I'm hoping to get uh, like a, like a, dry demo out soon of just acoustic stuff just get just get something out there because cool. um, it's been two years since my last album dropped three almost three years now oh wow uh, yeah I, i've got 500 something original songs so a lot of the times when it comes to recording by the time i get to a point where it's like the project's done everybody's like oh where's your new songs so <laughs> i have to figure out how to like home record stuff to where it's decent enough quality but I don't have to spend a lot of money to go to a recording studio and make it sound good so that I can mm. can sell all of the songs that I have. You know, I just, I don't have enough money to go in. And I think my last album cost me something like $27,000 when all was said and done. I believe oh. you. We talked to your producer. Yeah, we, we know. Mm -hmm. Great mm -hmm. guy. Great guy. But I believe it, it can add up because of that process. I don't just, have yeah. a band. I don't have a band. So... I have to depend on paying instrumentalists and musicians to fill in the gaps and stuff like that. And it sucks. Well, I mean, remember, I always told you that I'm, I'm there. I'm not going to yes, charge you. Yeah? I know, but you're, you're a busy man. And if anybody deserves for me to pay studio time, it is you. I would love to pay you studio time. Um, I just, I don't have the ability to pay people what they're worth. And I always get caught up with, I don't want to take their time. I don't want to be like all of these people who are like, Hey, come and do this thing for me. And we'll give you exposure. Cause that sucks. And exposure can't pay rent. And all y'all have like kids and lives and wives and people that depend on them. Like you need that money and you need whatever time you've got to like work on your projects and things. Like I'm not trying to take away from anybody else's serious thing. I just would like to have a band that is like serious and wants to play with me consistently. Um, yeah. But getting, getting people to play every genre is really difficult. Mm -hmm. You just got to get those getting, like diehard, like ride or die people that, you know, I mean, trust fine, me, we've, Kenny, please let me know. Well, <laughs> we've, we've, <laughs> we've had to change the roster a few times. It's just, you know, life takes you in different places sometimes right. and you can't always find individuals that are going to have the same kind of, um, you know, mentality and approach to, to music, you know? Don't I know it. I just actually trusted a band to help me for my NPR audition, um, which never got submitted because my guitarist totally screwed me over. So. Yeah. So. Uh... Ended on who I thought were my friends and nope. And so that was cute. That was really cute. Wasted an entire other year of my life. Well, you know, uh, the interesting thing, uh, you know, just kind of piggybacking on what Ruben was saying is, uh, yeah, yeah, the whole the whole band thing is so fleeting, you know. Um, and but every once in a while, every once in a while, you'll find someone that's like, oh shit, this is this is the person, you know. And uh, hey, Ruben. Talking about you, buddy. <laughs> yeah, man, right back at you, man, you know? Uh, he's been very consistent for the last 10 years, so I, yeah. I know, but he's got his own band, so I'm not trying to take him out of his band and, and take him, because I want somebody who wants to live in my band, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. But, you know, I, I definitely believe that there's, you know, out there somewhere, there's, there's other Rubens, too. No offense to you, Ruben. 
but um no no it's okay um, no i know that there's a million of all of us out there we're really not as special as we like to think i mean we are all of us special but i feel like i feel like there's really just like eight notes right you can do a lot of things with those eight notes but eventually you're gonna yeah. repeat a couple you know, repeat a phrase whether you like to or mean to or not Oh, yeah. Like I always say, it's all out there in the Akashic record already, right? We're just tapping into it. <laughs> just tapping into it. That's it. Absolutely. Which actually, my friends just opened up a meditation center in New York called the Akashic Garden. So. Oh, nice. Cool. Yeah, See? See? Throwing it out there. <laughs> Throwing it out there. I'm just, just I'm being I'm probably a... going to go work for them eventually in New York for a little while. but. That's cool. It's going to be fun. I'm going to go get my, my shaman license this year. Very oh, cool. Exciting. Awesome. So with... With all that's been going down right now with, with freaking quarantine, COVID, how have you guys been doing? I know you you had like a million different things going on, you know? You were you were just hustling left and right, you know? You were a teacher. Trying to, trying to. Because all of my jobs got canceled, it was kind of like how to right. make rent. And right. I didn't get bailed out. Um, I put in for the, the relief. I never got the $1,200. I never got any sort of back pay. I never got any sort of like a... Um, unemployment or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, unemployment. Couldn't couldn't get any of that. They never... Nothing. So I've just been kind of sitting, uh, trying to learn how to spend only $100 a week on medication and bills and <laughs> food and groceries. Well, that's the thing. That's the thing, right? And bills and... You, yeah. You've always hustled. I've known you since I've known you and you were a kid. You know, you, you, you had a pretty badass car and no one gave that to you. You know, you, you did that on your own on your own back, you know what I mean? Like that's that's always been you, you know? You were always hustling your music, selling your CDs. So man, that sucks. It sucks to hear that it that's happened, suck. you know? It does suck, um, but whatever. Mm. <laughs> it is what it is. You just right. make some about it and call it good. Nothing else you can do. Well, I get the feeling that, you know, we're gonna have much better days ahead of us. Uh, I, I think, think so. so too. I think people are also realizing how important art is. Yes. Yeah. 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 There was a loss of that appreciation, right? Thing. For a while. Yeah. If they've learned one thing, it's about the consumption of art and just how much art they consume on the regular, um, and how therapeutic it is for them to consume art on the regular. I mean, like we are, we yeah. are the ultimate therapists. I've made so right. many people cry while playing music, not intentionally trying to make them cry, but they just break down and weep, you know? So. I you know, I'd like to now. think, I'd like to think that with what's going on that, you know, I remember, I mean, I've been, I've been doing bands for over 20 years now. Right. And it's always tough when you first start working out in a project. And even when you're further along in a project to get people to, you know, to to actually come out like they'll be like yeah yeah i'll go check you out whatever crickets right please please I, tell me when your concert is please put me on a mailing list please and then you're like <laughs> right. hey there's a concert and they're like mm. right but i'd like to think that with all this time that we've had to be at home and we've had to be away from that and missed that i'm hoping that we get to reconnect with that not not, not i don't mean like just the three of us i mean us as a society because We've moved really far away from that. We don't appreciate that. I remember people telling me, uh, is somebody going to record it? I'll just watch whatever you do on YouTube right. later. And I'm like, I'm like, dude, come on. That's, you know? Yeah. You, first of all, it doesn't even feel the same when you watch it on YouTube. It doesn't. And the sound quality is going to be awful. And then, you know, like, just be there. Be there in the moment. Feel everybody else there exchanging energy. It's a really beautiful experience. I it is. I really wanted to many many years ago and actually i found out that they have the technology for it now so i'm thinking about maybe even starting it again <clears throat> i wanted to start a project called music for all ears um and it would be wristbands and different things that vibrate and pulsate to music for people who are hard of hearing and deaf so that they can oh. go to live music concerts wow. um, and feel it and feel what it's like to be back in that group of people exchanging energy because when you talk to somebody and you say hey what was the like the 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 first like big, big experience in your life, about 80% of them say it was a concert. Mm-hmm. And so I'm thinking right. there's a million some odd people in California that are deaf or hard of hearing. And that's a million some odd people that are never going to be able to feel what I feel. And what we have literally created a space to do daily because it's something that we love so much that we're willing to put everything aside to do it. I, 
it just kind of makes me kind of sad that there's an entire group of millions of people who will never get to experience the unifier of music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Seriously. I couldn't imagine like there was times in my life where I really depended on music. I depended on like, just like, you know, I felt like that was something that was listening, something that I could connect to. And I couldn't, I don't know. I don't know where I'd be if I didn't have that, you know? When you don't have the capability of expressing what you're going through, or you don't even know what you're going through yet. Sometimes we right. can't even identify the emotions and then you hear a song and you go, that's it. That's what I was trying to say. That's what yeah. I was feeling. And they just, they nailed it. They got it right. They just, they ripped it out of my, my diary. And it was like, they read that out of my soul. And I think that that relatability of music is so freaking important. And here's a phenomenon that I never even really expected to, to think about until this woman talked about it. She's a deaf woman or she teaches and works with the deaf. And she was like, so I'm driving in my car and my favorite song comes on and I lean forward and I turn up the music and I go, Oh, my song. And I turned up the song and my deaf friend who's been deaf since she was a baby looks at me and goes, if it's your favorite song, why do you need to hear it better? Haven't you heard it like a million times before? Mm. Why would you need to? But that's an automatic thing when you hear your jam, right? What do you do? Ah, crank it up, right. crank it up. <laughs> you know, when I was Wait, a kid, shut up. Exactly. When I was a kid, <laughs> I was the first one to start driving, and there was this Red Hot Chili Peppers song called "Tear." That oh, yeah. it was this part, this little trumpet part in the song, and I would tell everybody to shut the fuck up. This is my moment of zen. <laughs> just, just like, give me like ten seconds, you know? Like seriously. I know. And every single time it came on, my mom was like. Why are you talking to me like that? You know, like for real, you know? <laughs> yeah. Or Silence. like so many of us do, you get to your, your house after driving home after a really long wait. night to yeah. work and you wait. Yeah, you wait until the end of the song. The song is done. Now I can turn off my I, car and now I can go inside. And I think <laughs> that's such an incredible, like relatable experience that everybody has right. from all over the world. I went to Egypt. And they all looked at me like, the fuck? First of all, why are you here, American? Why are you in Egypt? And then second of all, when I would say I was a musician, they would be like, oh, can you can you sing us something? Like, could you? And so immediately beyond the, the language barrier, right? The language barrier goes out the window and they go, oh, and then I can sing an Adele song and they go, oh, I had this Egyptian guy give me a big hug and he gave me a bracelet that he made out of wood and it's like turquoise and it's just gorgeous. And he was like, you are my American Adele. I love you. Oh, wow. And awesome. gave me a, a bracelet. I mean, like, that's, that's cool. I didn't have to talk to this man. I just played some music and he knew who I was and like loved me for that. I think that's really cool. We could just speak through vibrations. Um, right. Actually, at, at the concert last year, when you were like, hey, can I borrow your guitar? And I was like, yeah, but it's it's tuned to 432. So, you know, one of your friends right, or right. an audience member sprinted over to me and he was like, wait, you intentionally tune your guitar to 432? And I was like, yeah. And he goes, like on purpose? And I was like, yeah. And he goes, wow, I'm a music therapist. That's incredible that you do that. And I was like, well, yeah. If I'm going to go out there and give my sound waves to people, I want to make sure that they're healing people. Right, so right. Two or five twenty-eight. I'm not gonna go out there and hurt your frequencies. I'm gonna love it. I remember hearing that in the background. I was like, "That's super cool," you know. That's awesome. awesome. You know, it's funny. Our friend, our friend Carlos, always says that. Our friend Carlos from Tijuana always says, "Power of music. It's what unites yeah, us." Yeah. You know, all the time. And he's right. He's right. You know, like we made so many friends that were complete strangers. You and I were complete strangers, but the power of music. You know united us and now here you are you're like one of the league of extraordinary gentlemen that i always call upon whenever i need help you know whenever yeah whenever yeah something yeah needs to be done there's definitely people that you can just like reach into your grab bag of people i really want to start um i really want to start a like a podcast or something called falling in love with strangers i think that's going to be on my plate for this year um i have this app called smule it's a singing karaoke app where you can sing with strangers from all over the world anytime day or night Oh, cool. It's yeah. Very, very cool. Especially for an insomniac, because I can just, just get on any time. I own a t shirt company, so I made myself this this shirt, um, actually. Oh, nice. Mule oh, there anonymous. you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I'm on it all the time, and I have people jump into my inbox and be like, I saw you at six o'clock this morning, and now it's 4 p.m., and you're still online. Have you gone to sleep yet? I'm like, no, not at all. 
just been singing with people from Malaysia and New Zealand. Got a whole group of New Zealanders who calls me Amy Lee Winehouse. Amy Lee Winehouse is here. She's going to sing us a song. I love Amy Lee Winehouse. I'm like, I love you guys. Thank you so much. Um, but it's been really cool because you're in this platform, which is completely anonymous. I only know people's screen tags. They get to say and do a lot of things that societally are not really looked well upon. If I'm friends with you and I say, you know, I don't really like your, your sister's boyfriend, even if you don't also like your sister's boyfriend, that's already like a line of loyalty that you've crossed over. And now I have some sort of feeling about you and the way that you feel about me and mine, right? So there's a lot of things that we keep inside of us that we don't really express because we're afraid that somebody from church is gonna judge us or somebody that I work with is gonna judge us or I'll get fired or I'll do this or my aunt is gonna look at me some sort of way or I'll be cut out of the will or whatever it may be. I feel like we kind of don't really talk very genuinely along um, certain lines with friends and mm -hmm. who are right, friends, right. Who are friends with people for a long time and never really know them. Right. Because You're right. We don't talk You're about absolutely religion right. or politics, and we don't talk about how you feel about homos, and we don't talk about all these different little things that we're just not supposed to ever talk about. Our core values, right? We're not supposed to exchange core values. And so when you end up in a platform like Smule, where you're just kind of singing and talking to people, you start with music. That's the unifier. That's what brings them in. If they want to stay for the conversation, they stay. If they don't, they leave. Mm -hmm. And so the people who you end up sitting and, and coexisting with are people who are really thinking the same way as you. And that causes a lot of really cool exchange of honest emotion and genuine emotion that people aren't used to getting. And so they kind of have a tendency to fall very deeply in love with one another. And I've watched it happen a bunch of times and it's really kind of fun. <laughs> um, how often do you get somebody who just kind of bears their guts and traumas at you on the first date? It's tough. You know, I'll tell Never, you from personal. You yeah. like you. Right. You always have this like protective barrier, this wall, this, you're thinking likability, likability, right? Yeah. yeah you don't want to scare people off. They take it the wrong way. Right. Or what if I, you know, and I didn't right. raise it right. And then they think that I'm this way, or I think this way, or this, blah, 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 blah. And there's all these little eggshells that you got to walk on. <clears throat> but in this situation, if they don't like it, they can leave. And the mm -hmm. ones who do like it, you know that you can say anything in front of them. Mm -hmm. And so I've got some of my best friends in the entire world. I've never met face to face. But they, they know, know I, me deeper than people that I've known forever. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Wow. It's like a real deep connection there because you're able to bear those emotions, that realness, you know? I know mm -hmm. Mike and I had an experience where we, uh, we're talking about some of the songs we wrote on the last record. And I, I wish I could go back and do that again because I was doing that in a room full of like, I don't know, like maybe eight, nine people. And, you know, some of the subject matter is really, really honest, really, you know, it shows a lot of vulnerability and I just couldn't do that. You know what I mean? I, I listen to the interview sometimes and I'm like, I could see the moment where I wanted to be honest and I just couldn't. Cause then I saw like all these faces looking at me and I was just like, eh, better not, you know? And it's a shame. No, it's a shame. I, I wish I could have done that. More when people kind of throw up their guts on, on stage, I really appreciated, like, not a huge fan, but I really love that song, Anyone, that she wrote three weeks before she overdosed and ended up in a rehab facility. Have you ever heard that? Song? You know what? It cut right when you said the name. Who was it? Right. Oh, anyone. She wrote the song, Anyone, <clears throat> um, three weeks before she overdosed and ended up in rehab. Who, who was that, though? Like, like literally, when you said Demi the Lovato. name, it cut. Demi Lovato. Demi Lovato, okay. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Gotcha. Not a huge, huge fan of her music, but there's a performance of her where she's singing the song Anyone. And the um, the chorus is is just talking about, like, uh, I talk to shooting stars, but they always get it wrong. I feel stupid when I sing, because nobody's listening to me. Nobody's listening. Anyone? Please send me anyone. Lord, is there anyone? I need someone. And it's just her just kind of like throwing up her guts of I've been on stage. I used to like try to get the, the world's attention. I used to consult liquor and drugs and sex and whatever to try to find good feelings. And I couldn't find any of them. And I just feel like I'm screaming to nobody. Like I just feel like right. nobody's listening. Mm. And so even though like she has been known for sugar pop Disney stuff. She got on stage and was like, I have drug addiction. I have alcoholism. I have mental health issues. I have, and she just kind of 
all of her scars on stage and that just makes me go i thank you right thank you. people need to know that money does not shield you from awful feelings people no it doesn't know that fame and success does not shield you from mental health problems like people people need to know that this stuff is not something that you can just like feel better about like, like when you're it's not automatic Ill. yeah right right yeah yeah you can't just like tell somebody oh well you're really successful you should be able to walk i'm paraplegic fuck you guys <laughs> like, i can't just walk you know and unfortunately unfortunately a lot of the wrong people tend to be around you too when you're when you're when you're successful or when you know shit like that's going on they just yeah. take advantage they want to know how much you can get and that's one thing that i'm very grateful about this big house that i live in currently it's kind of i used to call it fame training i'm used to people like thinking things about me because of this house that i live in and they're just making assumptions yeah right just right you can think whatever you want about me it's not right I mean, I've known you long enough to, to see through that shit. You know what I mean? And it's just, right. I, I could see how that would be a thing. You know, it kind of weeds fucking assholes out, right? Oh, it cuts, it cut out a lot. But yeah, it def definitely weeds out the, the ones who are trying to get something from you versus the people who are actually there because they have your back. Um, but it's also a worry. It's also right. a worry in the back of my mind. Anytime I bring anybody over to my house, I'm like, are they going to keep me around because they like me at this point or are they going to keep me around because they think I can give them something? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. But uh, Vivian, I'm, what it is. I'm very sorry. It, it seems like we've, uh, we've actually hit our, our uh, time for, oh, our for our episode. I'm, I apologize. Um, so uh, I just want to say I'm super thrilled to talk to you again. Uh, thanks for coming on the show. Um, you know, I, Ruben and I Anything. both are really looking forward to, to playing with you again, to, to see, to hanging out with you again. Um, in the Me meantime, too. you know, we definitely take this time in the, in the episode for you to just, uh, one, one last, um, conversation with our audience, um, just stuff that you're up to stuff to look forward to. Um, that's where to find you plugs. Being built. My website is being built right now. So if you look at my name, the I-V-I-E-N-N-E, Vivian.love is my website name it is under construction so we're working on getting the store all settled out and stuff like that and there's gonna be merch and things to to kind of keep an eye out for i'm going to be redoing my youtube probably this week or next week so there's going to be some content that's going to be uploaded as soon as possible um you can look up my youtube as vivian castillo it's just the same just the same here um it's pretty much it as far as on the horizon. Haven't really been planning anything because SIP has made things kind of really difficult to, right. to plan. Yeah. Um, but yeah, keep an eye out. The websites are coming. Cool. 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 It'll have, it'll have web updates and all that stuff. All right. And hey, you know what? I think 2021 is going to be an awesome year for don't say that out loud. It might fucking hear you, dude. It might hear you. <laughs> Don't challenge it like that. We ain't got to see. No, because everybody was like, 2020 is going to be my year. 2020 is great. It's going to be amazing. Right. Everybody says that shit, you know? The beginning and then of the, the year. And the Mayan calendar was just like, surprise, bitch. It's actually 2012 again. What, yeah. What, right. Like, right. Are, so. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't carry the one or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah, right. Dude, we're up. Yeah. Yeah. Years, but I think this is 2012 at this point. Yeah. <laughs> been hard but yeah we'll get there though yeah we'll get there <clears throat> oh one more thing about my production company here's a, another shameless plug so heart studios productions incorporated is built on paying our actors for their time and talent paying our writers for their amazing stories and also we always tie ourselves to charitable efforts so the last one that we were doing was australia fire relief we raised a thousand dollars for them um, previously we did 2,500 for the Paradise Fires. We did a thousand for the ones down in LA. Um, and then we always try to donate as much as possible to whatever the topic is. So we did mental health. We had a lot of uh, mental health awareness information being spread around. Um, we had like different little stimming toys that we were selling for a little more expensive than they normally are. You were there actually, you saw the rings, yeah. I think. Um, yeah. so we would sell the stimming toys. And then we use the extra money and stuff like that goes into the till. And then we can actually donate some of those STEMI toys to, to places that need them. Organizations, right. Yeah. Organizations. Um, yeah. 
outreach programs and whatever. So we're always trying to. So my music is going to be the same way in the future. Anything that's under the Heart Studios and in, in, um, Productions Incorporated umbrella is going to be partially towards charity. I do want to be a superhero and a philanthropist in my in my future. Um, but it's really hard to do that as, a, as an artist and a teacher because we don't make the money. So right. I don't want to be famous because I want to be famous. I'm actually autistic and I really don't like people. But I want to be famous with like lots of people and whatever so that I can get support and I'll at least bring awareness to some places that really need the awareness. Mm. Um, and the finances. If I had $300 million, if I had a Dell money, oh my God, the things that I would do. Building schools, paying teachers so they don't have to buy their own supplies. Like, ooh wee. So that's the hope. The hope is eventually gaining enough momentum and getting enough butts and seats that we can actually start financing some pretty cool programs and sheltered, like uh, battered women's shelters and um, yeah. just different outreach, community outreach places that we've got around here. We oh, want to cool. give back. We really want to give back. I'm not trying to get famous to get money. I know what money's like. It's not that great. Well, <laughs> Yeah, I I agree. Money is not that great. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, cheers to a to an awesome future, um, Vivian. We're very much looking forward to uh, seeing you again, um, and hopefully that will be very soon, sooner than later. Yeah. As soon as possible. So, right. Very I soon. Some of my my best friends here. Likewise, honestly. Likewise. likewise yeah. <laughs> Throw you the horns there. There you go. Thank you for giving us your time for chatting with us shooting the shit it's been awesome Any cool time right on thank you for having me all right and with that see you guys thank you have a good night all right